John Wesley was raised the son of an Anglican minister, and he studied at Christ Church in Oxford, and while there, he continued in the practice of religious observation that he had learned growing up in his own home. He attended worship services, he read the Bible, he said his prayers, he received communion according to the traditional requirements of life at what was then a Christian university. According to his biographer, Daniel Burnett, in a conversation with a porter of Christ Church, John Wesley confessed, quote, there was something in religion that I have not found. And so Wesley doubled down on his religious quest to live as a real Christian. In his own words, a, a quest to become a whole Christian and not only half a Christian. Uh, and so in 1728, he was ordained a priest in the Church of England. His ministry has been described then as one of stern authority and high churchmanship, but softened by a spirit of genuine compassion for people and a desire to serve. After graduation, he continued teaching at Oxford, and after reading William Law's books on Christian perfection and a serious call to a devout and holy life, Wesley became determined to give everything he had to God. His body, his soul, his substance. He was confident that his service to God would bring salvation for his soul. After his brother Charles joined him at Oxford and founded a, with a group of others, a, 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 a group that would structure their lives around devotion to God, John joined with them and they determined to take communion every week, devote themselves to the serious, serious study of the Bible, Others at Oxford mockingly called them the Holy Club, but it was a name that stuck. And through deeds of self-discipline and good works by obeying the will of God in every area of their lives, John and the other members of the Holy Club would make themselves acceptable to a holy and righteous God. In 1735, John traveled to Georgia across the Atlantic to the American colony to be a missionary to Native Americans and to minister to the colonists there. And while aboard a ship during a three-month journey, he became friends with a group of German-speaking Moravian Christians. Wesley was deeply struck by the faith of these Moravian followers of Jesus. During storms and rough seas, the English passengers would scream in panic and flail about their arms while the Moravians sit there would sit there and just sing hymns about Jesus. When Wesley asked him whether they or their families were afraid, the answer was a simple, no, our women and our children are not afraid to die. Wesley longed for whatever it was that the Moravians had, a, a faith and an assurance that he was acceptable to God, that God had forgiven his sins, that he was indeed a whole Christian and not just half a Christian, and that he could live without a fear of death or a fear of spending eternity under God's judgment. He, he knew he lacked what these followers of Jesus, these Moravians, had. And so he did what he knew to do, which was to double down again on his religious observation in Savannah, he instituted a strict regime of, of religious rules and laws that made him the most hated man in the entire colony. At one point, his religion was so rigid that he refused a Moravian Christian to take communion because he didn't feel like they had been properly baptized like by a minister of the Church of England. In Georgia, John Wesley fell in love with a young woman but decided not to pursue her in marriage because he was afraid that his love for her would eclipse his love for God and thereby threaten his eternal salvation. He also began to run afoul of authorities in Georgia who ironically registered ten counts against him for breaking the rules. They demanded bail as he awaited trial. He skipped bail under cover of darkness and returned to England, but again... On the ship ride back to England, he was terrified of death and of eternal condemnation because he was a sinner. He had slipped into a, a religious despair, and some of you, you know, given the mindset of North American culture, look at it, you say, come on, John Wesley, snap out of it. God's a God of love. But no, he understood something about God. He understood that a holy and righteous God could not let evil stand could not let injustice stand, could not let cruelty stand, that sin could not dwell in, fa in the face of a holy and righteous God. You know, you think, think about the sun. You look at the sun, 
And if you stare at it long enough, its light will blind you because you are not equipped to handle what it has. Think of the one who made the sun, who fuels the sun. Do you think you could stare at him and survive? He understood something that today we don't understand, that, that there's something wrong with us and that we need God to do something. A Moravian pastor in Savannah had asked Wesley, does the Holy Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? And Wesley had frozen. He didn't know how to answer. The pastor again asked, do you know Jesus Christ? And Wesley could only respond that he, he knew that Jesus was the Savior of the world. The pastor said, but do you know how he has saved you? And Wesley could only express a vague hope that he would somehow be saved. In his journal, John Wesley confessed that he didn't even know himself. He was always striving but never measuring up. He was trying through religion to find a compassionate face to God, and he was gripped by fear and dread. On January 24th of 1738, he wrote a note in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me. It's a story that's played out throughout history, people striving through religious devotion, through sacrifice, through uh, theological precision to become one of the good people, one of the people that God should bless, that God should forgive, that God should save, because I'm one of the good people, not one of those other people. See, God, I worship, I tithe, I serve you, I evangelize, I do all this stuff for you, God. You've got to bless me now. And the result is always either pride on account of spiritual accomplishment or despair because of perceived failure. And what comes from either one is often a narrowness, an argumentative nature, a critical spirit that sees the worst in others and the best in themselves. Our despair then when we realize we're broken or our pride when we don't. We begin this morning to look at a book, St. Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome that has more than any other brought freedom to those who were crippled by religion and who struggled to believe the good news of Jesus. This is the first chapter of Romans, the first seven verses. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he pr promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also were among those who were called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who were loved by God and called to be saints. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we see here? first thing we see is that Christianity is not an invitation, it is a declaration. What term that's used here, Paul repeatedly talks about the gospel of God, the gospel. He, he repeats it. it, it it's, it's a compound word uh, meaning good news, uh, uh, a, a good message, a, a, a a message is something that's dispatched to inform other people about major events. Uh, it, it can be translated a herald, to herald uh, the message. The uh, picture here is, is um, if you picture a distant battlefield and the people in the city in ancient Greece are being attacked, think Marathon, and, and their enemy is much larger with more advanced weaponry and, and more determination, and they're, they're 
their, their army has gone out to a distant battlefield to meet the enemy. There's not much hope. They don't have a chance, and, and they know that what's going to come next, once their, their, their troops have been defeated, is that army is going to lay siege to the city, and eventually the city is going to starve, and they're going to have to open the doors, and, and they know what's going to happen to the women, and they know what's going to happen to their sons being taken into slavery, and the men are probably going to die and they're going to lose everything, and everything will be over. And yet, as the people wait in fear, wondering their fate, waiting for the next shoe to drop, they see a runner in the distance. They see a little puff of smoke as the runner's sandals are kicking up dirt. And as the, the runner comes to the doors of the city, he shouts up to the people on the walls, We have been victorious. The enemy has been defeated, and the city is saved. That's a gospel. That's a good news, a herald of, of, of good news of events that have happened, that have transpired, that have already been completed, that have brought to you already a great salvation. That's what gospel means. That's what good news is. And Paul calls himself an apostle or an emissary, one with full authorization to bring this declaration that God has done something, something profound, the gospel of God, literally calls it God's gospel, God's good news, God's herald, God's, you know, statement of events that have transpired. This is not advice to be followed. This is news about events that have happened that radically will change your life. You know, too often religion is filled with advice. We don't need advice. Everybody wants to give advice. What we need is a declaration that our enemy, before whom we were hopeless, has been met on the field of battle and defeated. That's, that's a declaration, not advice. They're different things. A declaration that the city has been rescued. You know, just, just this week in Georgia, yet again, we heard of another school shooting, and some of you parents, this is close to home, and some of you have wondered, what if, what if you were that parent in Georgia waiting for news of your child? What would that have been like? Um, it's a parent's worst nightmare. There's nothing, you know, a parent would gladly give up their own life to keep that from happening. And, you know, you imagine what it would be like. You're going through your day and your phone vibrates and you're annoyed at the interruption, but you look down and you see it's a message from an emergency services and a local high school has been put on lockdown and, and, and you scan for the name of the school and you realize it's your daughter's school and it's your nightmare. And so you drop everything and you grab your car keys and you drive way too fast, almost knocking over 15 trash cans to get to that school. And what you are greeted with is a block from the school. There's police tape and everything's cordoned off and there are ambulances with sirens going there police vehicles, there are fire trucks, there, you know, everybody is there, and you cannot get to the school, and they have sent, you know, you know, officers into the school to try to take care of the situation, and, and, and there are hundreds of students being loaded at the school onto buses out the back cafeteria doors and brought to the police tape. And you start seeing all these reunions, mothers over, you know, collapsing in joy, tears, crying, students all being, being connected with their parents, and there's so much joy, and yet all the kids are out. The school buses are empty, and you look around, and your daughter isn't here. Your daughter's still in that school, and all you can do is sit there and wait while everybody else goes home. And then some lovely gentleman comes up to you, and he says, you must be worried. I know a lot of really good techniques about managing worry and anxiety. Let me tell you, the first thing I would do if I were in your shoes is you'd say, shut up! My daughter's in that school. I don't want to hear your advice. That's religion. Because at that moment, the only thing you need the only thing you want is for that moment when that officer comes up to you and asks you, are you the parent of this child? And you say, yes, that's my daughter. And she's safe. She's fine. We got all the kids out. Everybody's fine. We can take you to her now. That's a declaration. Salvation has already come. It is already done. And all you need to do is believe it and rejoice. That's the difference. Christianity is not a religion. It's not a list of advice. 
It's a declaration of something that God has done. The herald from the far-off battlefield is brought to you. The good report that's going to change your life forever. So what is the report? The report is not a program. The report is a person. We read the gospel regarding his son. The good news is Jesus. Uh, the good news is, is a, a declaration that Jesus has done something, but it's about a person, not a plan. Jesus has fought the battle for you. He has emerged victorious. You are now free. It's a declaration that Jesus, the champion, has fought the battle that you and I could have never fought successfully. We would have gone down in flames. But he's done it for us because he loves us. You know, I, I don't know how to help you see, because some of you, you've been in church for your entire lives, and, and somebody gets up in the pulpit, and all you hear is, God, Bible, Bible, God, Bible, God, Bible, church, Bible, God. And, and it's just, that's it. And I want you to understand that Jesus knows when you are speaking to him. He is aware of you. And he has set you free on the cross. And when he said it's finished, he meant the work of saving you has been finished. And all of your sins are forgiven if you have Jesus. You have been justified or declared worthy in God's eyes. You have been adopted as children of God. And the Father now has all the duties and responsibilities of a father toward his much-loved child. You have been loved passionately. That word loved we see here. Called and adopted. Uh, here you're called saints, literally holy ones, because you've been clothed in the holiness of Christ. You have an inheritance, and the Father is never going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. There's nothing that you can do that's going to separate you from the love of God, not in the past, not in the future. Um, you know, you're sitting here thinking, Greg, this is true of all these other people, but not of me. No, I'm talking to you. Whatever it would take to convince you that God loves you, He has already done, even to the point of giving up His own Son for you. You know, you wanted all your life to find somebody who would love you. Somebody who'd lay down his life for you. And here in Jesus, you see the one who has already done just that. He loves his sheep. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me shall be saved. There's nothing that you can do to out -sin the blood of Jesus. It's finished. This is 200 proof gospel. It's 100% grace. Jesus plus nothing equals your salvation. It's Christianity 1.0, which is the original version that never needed upgrading. There's so much religious self-help so many lists of biblical principles, and yet a bad marriage plus biblical principles is still a bad marriage. A bad marriage plus Jesus can see healing and change and love and life. The declaration of Jesus is a declaration that he is the person of salvation, not the person of religious self-help. Through him, Paul writes, and for his name's sake, we have received grace. There's an actual encounter here with the divine that's real. It's not make-believe. You know, some of you, some of you are terrified of an actual intimate relationship with God. Some of you fear that if you open up your emotions, your hearts, your very life to him, that he's not going to show up. You're afraid to risk that. You don't feel like your faith would be able to handle the disappointment. But I hope you can hear St. Paul declaring that the world has now changed. It's not like it was before. Now is the time to risk it, to not hold back any chips but go all in with Jesus, to say, say, you're my Savior and I trust you. You know, he's been declared as the Son of God. Now is the time to hear him. Now's the time to welcome him in, to open up your affections, to open up your whole life and say, Jesus, have me. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, wherever you're going to point out that I'm wrong, I'm okay because I'm all in with you because I am hitching my car to your engine and I'm going where you're going. Why not now? Now is the time for revival. Why wait? Christ is standing before you as victor. He's conquered sin. He's conquered death. Let's worship him. He's coming to you now, the man of salvation himself. It's not an invitation. It's a declaration. And what it's declaring is not a program, but a person, Jesus. And this brings us into a life of belonging 
and you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Called to belong is the words the Bible writes there for you. There are people in this life who don't want you to belong. There are people who are going to say, you're not good enough. You're not one of us. You're not welcome here. We don't want you part of our club. You don't belong. Jesus says, no, you do belong. You belong with me. You belong with my people to belong to Jesus Christ. He says you're loved. You're not a used sofa that God's waiting to get rid of once he moves. You're, you're claimed now by Jesus. You're loved and cherished and taken on this crazy new adventure because Jesus has come crashing into your life and everything's going to change. It's a transformative life. Paul talks about the obedience that comes from faith. That when you learn to trust Jesus, because you know he's trustworthy, you're going to change. It's going to transform every area of your life. It's like it did with, with St. Augustine, the African bishop in the, in the late 4th century, 390 or so, where, where he, was, he had come to believe that there is a God, and that that God was not a part of the created cosmos, but was apart from the cosmos that had created it. But he was not yet a Christian. And a friend of his, he was sitting in a Milan garden in Italy, and a friend gave him a copy of, of the letter to the Romans. Uh, this letter, and, and Augustine opened it up, and at that point, he was, you know, living with a woman outside of wedlock, all sorts of stuff. He, was, he had been living the life and was trying to change, but not succeeding, and he opened it up to later on in Romans when Paul says, live not in sin, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. At that point, he knew that what he needed was Jesus, and he believed in Jesus and trusted in him. And for that time, for the first time in his life, Jesus was his Savior, and he had eternal life and was baptized. It's a declaration here of the power of God, and this captured Paul's heart. Paul calls himself a slave to the gospel. That means he is the gospel's captive. Is your heart captive to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Has it captured you to the point where you find joy there more than in any other area, where the other areas are a calling, but this one is your core being. You know, has the gospel captured your home? Has the gospel captured your career? Has the gospel captured your marriage? If someone came and stayed with you for a week and took notes every day, every week of everything that was said, how would they summarize their trip? Would it mention Jesus? Would it talk about how, because of Jesus, you forgive one another? Because of Jesus, you're open and honest about your sins. You don't hide them. You don't just let them go away. You talk about them because you have the freedom that the gospel brings. Would they talk about how you love your enemies? Where is Jesus? Has the gospel captured your heart like it captured Paul's heart? Have you become its slave? Because it captivates you. What's it look like when people in churches get the gospel? Um, when you get the gospel, it's not simply a question of cognitively coming to certain understandings. Uh, it's a question of has it actually sunk in? Um, because you can admire Jesus, you can think he's great, you can understand what the gospel is, but, but until you've actually tasted it, until you've swallowed it, until you've let it come in and explode in its flavor within you, you're just looking at it from a distance, and it's just in your head and not yet in your heart. When it reaches your heart, what does it look like? Well, if, you, if it's not there, then you're going to live a life in fear. Um, fear of God, fear of in an unhealthy fear of God, as if God is your enemy. Uh, fear of failure, you're going to be trying to prove yourself all the time, you're going to be kind at times, but even your kindness will be self-serving because it's part of your religious project. You may be zealous, but you're not necessarily joyful. Typically, if the gospel is not sunk in, one of your main emotions is anger because you're judging people, and you're often judging God because you feel like he's not doing what he should do for all the good things that you're doing for him. And so you can take all the air out of a room and leave those around you tiptoeing around like on broken glass. Um, because you're looking for failures in others so that you could feel good and self-confident about your own spiritual standing, and you're going to become resentful. You're going to look down on others, even the people you're helping, because you have to be better. 
If you're successful, you're going to be aloof and arrogant, and if you fail, you will be falling down into self-loathing from which you will never be able to pull yourself out, and you're going to minimize your own sin because you have to, and you're going to maximize everybody else's, but ultimately you will have no power to actually change your heart, and those around you are going to feel judged. But when Christianity becomes real for you, and it sinks into your heart, it changes you. You live with a new freedom. You're able to take risks because you don't have to succeed. You can fail. It's the basic freedom because you're already righteous in Christ. You can have a confidence and a security because you know you're, that God is your dad and he's got your back and it can make you tenacious and vibrant because you know you are loved. It makes you a captive to the gospel. It's your most important thing, and you know you're loved, and you'll know you're accepted, and you'll freely own your own failings because your identity is no longer bound up in your performance, and others around you are going to feel free for the first time in their lives, free to be themselves around you because they know you're not evaluating them. You're not judging them. You're not criticizing them. You don't feel superior to them. They know that they stink too, and Jesus loves them. And so they can give you grace too, even helping you see it. Uh, You know, you're going to feel empowered and safe because you know God's got your back and you don't need to control the people around you so they start to feel free. And it enables you to deal with your sin because you don't have to minimize it, you can maximize it and see maximized grace releasing you from that burden. And your joy is no longer... Uh, dependent upon being a good boy or girl. You know, you know on the playground, you can see which kids know that they are loved. You can see it. John Wesley had slipped into religious despair on his way back to England, and he wrote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? His Moravian friends observed that he had faith about Jesus, but that he didn't have any practical trust in Jesus. Jesus, the person who's real and is right there standing before us, saying, I want you to come to me. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me. I am gentle, and you can become gentle too. I am gentle, meek, and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is real, calling us to come, to receive salvation from him as a free gift, to go all in. On March 5th of 1738, Wesley finally confessed to himself that he did not believe in Jesus Christ. He was honest. In his own words, he became, quote, clearly convinced of my unbelief. Wesley became intellectually convinced that salvation is a free gift to those who believe Jesus, but he also realized that he did not trust Jesus to be his Savior. On May 24th, he attended a Methodist Society meeting in a Moravian Christian meeting house on Fetter Lane, Aldersgate, London, and he listened as one of those gathered read Martin Luther's preface to St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And as Wesley listened, he heard the gospel in a way that had never been able to reach him before. He realized he may not have even been a Christian before that moment, Even though he was a priest in the Church of England and the son of a priest in the Church of England, he writes in his journal about what he experienced as he listened to Martin Luther describing the good news as laid out in this book of Romans. He writes in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate. That's classic religious thing. I'm going to do it as a duty, but I don't want to do it. You know, that's the kind of... I went very unwillingly... (laughs) <laughs> to a society in Aldersgate where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. And about a quarter before nine, 8.45, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my own heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, emphasis original, and save me from the law of sin and death. For the first time in his life, John Wesley was trusting not in his own religious performance, but in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for him. 
For the first time in his life, he knew Jesus. And for the first time in his life, he knew and experienced the love of God. And for the first time in his life, he began to love Jesus. For the first time in his life, he had an assurance of eternal life that Christ had gone to hell on the cross for him, and there is no double jeopardy with God, and he would certainly go to heaven because Jesus cannot go to heaven unless John Wesley goes there with him, and John Wesley can't go to hell unless John Wesley, unless Jesus goes to hell with him because he is united to Christ in faith, and what is true of Jesus will be true of him. That year, his brother Charles would compose a hymn that describes this conversion experience. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Let's pray.